to the cloud. I think it'll go to you. Got it. So you guys will be asked. So, so um, really interesting studies there, mostly from the sales side, but looked at the difference of, um, of effectiveness in a sales process when everyone was on video. And there was like five to 7% differences. And so that same effectiveness um, engagement and having a personal connection is true. So, you know, when we work at Zoom um, and when we you know, work with schools, we always talk about that as being key. It is, it is you know, from the teaching side, I mean, I've been in um, online education for a long time and education and, you know, it's that, it's that aha moment that you can see and sometimes you can see it, um, you know, with adults, you certainly, um, your teachers, We'll see with their students if you guys have to teach online, but it's really important to um, to to model for your teams um, the use of the video um, to make to make that difference, not not just doing it. Um, as you guys, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you have used Zoom, and let me keep admitting your uh, your folks in. I'm sure many of you have used Zoom. And you know we're really proud of the effectiveness. We're proud that um, you know the video and audio work that um, folks are able to connect on computer, laptop, phone, on um, on uh, tablet devices, and Mac and PC pretty much equal. One asterisk I'll put there. Maybe some of you've already seen. Chromebook has a few um, deficiencies, but other than that, you basically have the same effectiveness across all devices and all platforms. Um, Zoom's, Zoom's um, capabilities in, in terms of um, bandwidth, really important. I mean, if you've ever, you know, Skype or, or Hangouts, Zoom uses about one quarter of the bandwidth per meeting, per person, than does any of the other um, applications. And the, and the third point with that is each of you, so we have, um, we have 27, 28 or so on this call right now. It is irrelevant the number of people on a call to the overall quality of the call. Each of you is monitored separately. Um, it's, it's a technology that is unique to Zoom. It's adaptive layer technology. Um, don't ask me for too many details, but what it's doing is it is monitoring each of your calls separately. It is adjusting each of you based on the bandwidth that you have and is allowing um, you to connect based on that bandwidth. And so if, you know, someone has a lower bandwidth capacity, Zoom will adjust the video, a few less pixels and will you know, make sure you stay connected. Number one is stay connected 100% by audio. And then after that, it is video depleting a little bit. So that should be the experience. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly proud of the It Just Works, if you will, internal mantra. Um, and um, hopefully you've had that experience. Okay. So that's a little introduction. Um, again, I still see a number, I think the newer people without video on, if you uh, can go ahead and turn that video on. So um, we were going to um, talk today and as I worked um, with David um, and Joe, um, I want to, I want to address really first off and we'll do this over, you know, 15 minutes or so, um, the security and privacy. Um, as many of you know, maybe it followed in the news. And um, perhaps um, you've had a chance to jump on Eric Yuan's weekly calls. Um, we are um, approaching um, the end of our 90 day um, security you know, period or updates. Um, Zoom went into a, um, a period at the beginning of the, um, the COVID-19 crisis um, that through the amazing boom of usage, uh, frankly, there was a lot of exposure about things that we could do better. 
And the number one thing that we learned as um, you know, a couple million free accounts were adopted for elementary education across the world, literally that kind of number. Um, what we learned is it is really a good thing when accounts are managed by the IT professionals at a school. And what got most notoriety, and um, we, we hope not um, too much of a sticking term that crosses over platforms, but the meeting bombing or Zoom bombing. And that, that impacted certainly Zoom's reputation and it created a perception um, that, hey, Zoom isn't secure. Zoom approached that, um, and again, I hope some of you have read um, Eric's, Eric Yuan, by the way, is our founder, our CEO, and um, just a superb leader. And Eric came out um, soon after, you know, this was, this was you know, wildfire in, in coverage, and said, look, we made a mistake. Um, and it's, it's twofold. Um, one, Eric had focused and, and stated that, you know, everything that has been done with Zoom over, over, you know, the years from the product launch in 2013 and his original design going back to 11 was about ease of use, simplicity, that a meeting host can start a meeting, that a attendee can join a meeting seamlessly easy, you know, and, and that should be the experience. And that's certainly how we want it. But what we learned as, as tons of schools in particular um, got Zoom and, and again, millions of other accounts were set up is that the security settings that were in place weren't necessarily used. And so the second mistake was that Zoom failed to, in essence, pre-set accounts to be at a higher security level. This wasn't about breaches of the technology or people hacking into Zoom. What it was about, um, and, and I'll, I'll come back to the settings and privacy, but more than anything, a, you know, when a meeting is, um, if someone comes into a meeting inappropriately, it, it usually happens from two reasons. One, an attendee sent out a copy of that meeting link, right? That's one. And so students had great fun in a lot of cases, even posting publicly, here's the meeting link, you know, and there was a website that I know about, you know, it was kind of a, a target to 19 to 22 year olds where they would do this they would get meeting invites from schools and they would do really funny Zoom bombing and, and video it and then post it. But again, the effect is that uh, meetings were being disrupted. So one of them was students, in most cases, sending out invites you know, inappropriately. Second was meeting hosts publishing their meeting invite publicly. We've seen them, you know, join on Facebook or, um, you know, other sites like so that the meeting links were just going out there um, without the security. So, um, again, lesson for Zoom was no, even with free accounts, um, certainly with any K-12 accounts, we are going to start by making sure that the accounts are set to have maximum security. Okay, and what does that mean? So um, as you guys saw today, David set up, I mean, um, I'll admit Ginger Thornton. David set up meeting, um, set up uh, uh, waiting rooms. Waiting rooms are a really good way to make sure the people that come in are those invited. Now I have to say, as he passed me the, uh, the host license today, I don't know all of your names, so I could have been letting in some people that I don't know. But the idea is, so that's one thing. It is that, that you know, a teacher who has a classroom, um, a Zoom K-12 account will come with this setting in place, right? And that is, 
that's a really good way, kind of a first line. Now, that's not the only one. There are ways to set up so you authenticate everyone through single sign-on. And again, I'm not going to get into deep detail. We have good articles about it. But you can set it up so that everybody has a Zoom account, that they're authenticated with your school's domain, and that they're allowed into a meeting based on that authentication. And that, again, that is, um, that is, uh, in place now, it is used. We, we will typically see a school have an account set up like three different groups within the backside. Um, one for administrators that are a little bit more permissive, and I'll come back to those features. One for teachers that is tightly locked down. And you even create um, accounts for students, basic accounts, which are free. And those accounts you lock down so that the student cannot even create a meeting. You create a dummy URL. When they go to do it, it points to, you know, an NF, uh, URL doesn't exist, and they can't create a meeting. But you can use their Zoom account to authenticate. So, um, again, won't get into a lot of detail. Know that we have articles on that and how to do that. Other really key features to stop and to address security and the disruption of meetings. The sharing of a screen is where a, you know, a nefarious minded Zoom bomber um, is able to do his thing. Um, and so on free accounts and on education accounts, we begin by setting it up so that only the host can share a screen. Only the host can annotate. And when these kind of basic settings are put in place, what we've seen is a, you know, hundredfold decrease of any disruption of meetings. And when there are disruptions, um, in almost every single case, and, and literally, a, you know, a couple are, are through other um, breaches of information, but not hacking into Zoom you know, folks getting an account login or something like that. But in almost every single case, um, you just can't do anything to, um, to upset the account because you probably couldn't get in. And if you did get in, you couldn't share your screen. Um, you also couldn't um, uh, annotate or, or otherwise disrupt. The other thing Zoom did, and I'll show you on my um, desktop real quickly, the other, team, the other thing Zoom did, and again, these were all um, decisions made in the last 90 days. What you see on my screen, and this is, a, you know, I'm in the account. Um, what you see is this little unit here, security patch. Or, you know, it's, it's a little, and what that has done is it's um, put very quickly in the hands of a teacher the ability to address anything bad going on in the meeting. Um, allowing chat, let's say chat gets out of hand, or students are renaming themselves inappropriately, or they're unmuting themselves. Jim, it looks like you have someone in the waiting room. I will admit, Henry, thank you. Okay, and so that, Putting that security button at everybody's fingertips right away um, was done, I think, in the first two weeks of the 90-day um, security update um, promise. And, um, you know, that helps too. So those are some of the, you know, some of the responses that we have made. Um, and what I know from working exclusively in K-12 it's truly made a huge difference. You know, we are um, seeing very, very few incidents. Um, I'm not saying none because, you know, frankly, kids are pretty creative and, and um, some people outside can, you know, try to get credentials, but, but a meeting can be controlled. Um, teachers need to understand what they can do. They need to understand security of sending out an invite. Um, and we are, again, seeing almost nothing. So I'm going to stop for a moment um, and 
let's let's take some questions and discussion um, on some of these security issues. And I can unmute you guys. Um, I believe can unmute yourselves. So just feel free to uh, do that if you have any questions. Yeah. Jim, you mentioned the coming to the end of the 90 day security. I, I wasn't aware of a 90 day security thing. What, what is the significance of coming to the end of it? Yeah, um, good question, Joe. So um, that was a, um, that was a um, fixed time period that Eric created. Um, I guess it's back in March, April, May. So in, in April, May, June, so you know, late March, um, that we were going to get these things done. There was a list of, of security things we were going to get done. Um, the impact of it is non-existent. Um, we, will not, we will not stop whatsoever. In fact, um, you know, in our internal Zoom meetings, um, you know, they talk about the end of that and go, that means nothing to us. We are going to continue on um, doing this. We have hired um, in this 90 day period, um, a number of very high profile um, people. Um, you can see that on the Zoom blogs, the you know, chief security officers um, and others that have been hired to assure that this happens. We bought a company that is focused on, um, and what they do is end to end encryption to create that final link. And that's an option that you can take don't necessarily need it, but you can you can choose to have it. That's on all accounts now. Um, so it was an investment of people. It was an investment of technology, and it was a promise that we will get um, all of the initial concerns addressed in that period of time. But Joe, that does not mean whatsoever that we're stopping. The other thing it did um, was it froze all other product updates. So we had a ton of things queued up for release. Every one of them was put off and all energy from engineering was, was put into this issue. And again, um, I think addressed very well. Other questions? Can you mention again that end-to-end -end encryption you were talking about, is that a setting you can turn on or off? Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure it's, um, I think you may be requesting, I'm not sure exactly how it works because it just rolled out. But yes, it's a setting one way or another. Um, and again, well, you know, I'm not sure, you know, the, the encryption of Zoom is really good. Um, so I'm not sure it's something you want. I'm actually not sure why you would want to have it or not want to have it. It was rolled out about two weeks ago. Um, but um, there's certainly some of the, you know, financial um, industry accounts, government accounts, that, that, that that was essential. Okay. Jim, I'm, uh, has, has Zoom made any decisions um, about when those free educator accounts are going to revert back to the 40 minute um, time limit? No, um, but, or no and. Um, there is no intention of um, you know, putting schools, districts in a position, you know, that school starts in August, you go, whoa, there go those accounts. So that's not going to happen. Um, it is, um, you know, it is, there has not been a decision on the when. I can tell you that it's not going to happen at the start of the fall semester. And um, the best of my knowledge, um, you know, it's not, it's probably not going to happen mid-semester. That we do not there's two reasons. One of them is, is um, in, in acknowledgement of, of so many schools using this and relying on it. Um, we don't want to put you in a position, in a budget position, that in a couple weeks period, you'd have to go, oh my gosh, I got to do something. That's one. The second is a reality internally. And I know a couple of you have had um, you know, less than great experiences getting a hold of salespeople because we have been you know, tons of inquiries. Um, it's, hey, if we did that and turned it off, frankly, there'd be too many people calling. And we couldn't effectively do that. And, and most of the discussions um, with, you know, with, with schools um, and districts, they require discussions. I mean, most of the sales require discussions. And it's not just, you know, click here and buy. 
Um, sometimes that can, if you're getting a small account, you can just do that. But, but in a lot of cases, you know, it's about the suite of Zoom products and webinars and potentially Zoom rooms and potentially Zoom phones and, and maximizing your current um, hardware um, based conference room through uh, conference room connectors. And those require discussion and the crafting of, of you know, unique quotes. So, um, Dimitri, no, um, don't plan on that. No, no, I don't have a, yes, I don't have a date. Um, it's not going to be a surprise. There will be some lead time. Um, it, it very likely will end, but we don't have a fixed time. Thank you. On a, on, a, on a same note, um, relative to trial subscriptions, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate the assurance that we will not be, uh, our trial account will not be terminated without such uh, clarifying and uh, de deterministic conversations. Is that, am I, am I, is that fair to? Uh, well, your trial account, what, what are you talking about a trial account? Well, our, a trial account, right? A, 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 the, use of, the use of the free basic free trial account, right, for, for semantics, yeah. For, well, for I want to be semantics, clear. Free it, trial account. Right, we would not terminate your account. You have adopted basic accounts. Um, those basic accounts, you know, those are Zoom accounts. Um, and I assume you- so, so, so I'm sorry. Just for clarity, these, these are full full accounts, full, full, fully formed, fully fledged accounts. They just happen to be the trial, non-paid, I guess non-paid accounts. I just like the assurance that without such conversation that our accounts would not be pulled from under. I don't know. I don't know exactly what you're talking about. So if you have been given free trials, those free trials have an expiration date and that is on those free trials. I haven't set up with any of you free trial accounts. So I want to distinguish between a free trial account and the use of Zoom basic accounts with the request to have the 40 minute cap removed. Um, and um, that's what I responded to about Dimitri. And that is, um, we do not anticipate, I don't anticipate, and you will have notice um, that that cap will not be put in place. We had, a, we had a trial in place. I'm sorry, we had a trial in place for premium accounts for our teachers, and it expired, and the accounts reverted to the basic accounts, the non paid accounts. That's right. They, they, and they still did not have the 40 minute time limit. So that, that exception was preserved. So if you have trial accounts for premium now, then they'll just go to basic. And if you have basic accounts, those are enduring and they won't go away. That's so, right. so, so the basis of my question, this is all relative to reaching and uh, timely engagement and contact, uh, uh, being able to uh, contact the rep, right? The ability to contact our, our representative or account manager. So we certainly would not like that to happen. We'd like to be able to engage and have discuss, meaningful discussions, such meaningful discussions with our account manager to determine a path forward. So in the event that we are unable to reach the account manager or the representative, I guess that's the basis for the question, right? So well, okay. if we were to reach them at the, our representative in a timely manner, this would be moot. But in the event that we're unable to, for whatever reason, right? We've engaged, we've attempted to in a timely manner, you know, in advance of the, uh, end of the trial, mm -hmm. and we're unable to reach that representative. I'd like to ensure that we're either able to reach a representative or that our trial will not be. Okay, I, I, I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is you now have my email address. Okay. Um, and reach out to me. Awesome. Um, put, put an email on there and I'll help. I just put some, but I, the other thing I'd recommend, I just put a, um, a link in the chat. And what that is, uh, probably many of you have already done it. Sounds like Simon's done that if he hasn't. Um, that will, if you have not applied for that, apply for your school to have the 40 minute cap lifted. And what will happen if you already have your, um, your, um, your account, your, um, users in, uh, in an account. Like a domain. Yes, that will mean your domain will be, will have its 40 minute cap lifted. That was kind of that first conversation of when that's going away. Don't have a date, 
but it's, you know, it's not going to be, you know, a surprise. And so um, I would recommend doing that. So even if you're on a trial and it expires, your cap will not be lifted. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. And um, again, um, you know, part of this call today, um, exciting on my side, is getting to talk to a bunch of directors from a bunch of schools. So um, I welcome it. Um, I will get back to you um, as quickly as I can. And, you know, just give me as much information as you can and we'll, um, we'll address it, um, any contract stuff. Thank you. You bet. Um, may, may I change tangents? And I might have missed it because I came in a little late, but <laughs> authentication, um, it has so many benefits for schools because it's great that we have a waiting room, but you can type any name and allow somebody in because they have the right name, but it's not the student who is of record of your school. But your terms of service say that you can't have authenticated users below the age of 18. Um, another benefit of authentication is you can pre-make breakout rooms uh, without having to make them on the fly with a large group of students. Um, the downfall of authenticated uh, accounts is that students then under the school's domain get to um, record their own sessions at all hours of the night. Is there any, because I've read on Zoom where it says make your students authenticated, but yet it violates your terms of service. So where is that, no, so is you, that something different? Yeah, yeah, and I, I, address, I did address it a little bit up front, but not, not I apologize. in detail. So I think it's a good idea to issue students accounts. And you can issue them basic accounts or on a, um, a site-wide deployment, even pro accounts. However, um, those accounts, those, those students put into a separate group have their recording capability disabled and have their ability to launch a meeting disabled. So basically all you have done is authenticated them with a Zoom account tied to your school's domain. And you absolutely can do that um, at any age. And I, there, there may or may not be some little, you know, thing that you sign on behalf, but you can authenticate it. What we're getting at with that, um, and Maria is a student creating his own account um, under that okay. age. So, so you, you certainly can do that. And there's pretty good articles about that um, in the education resource. I'm is that a new kidding. setting where they can't launch an, a, a meeting? Because I must have missed uh, that. I don't, I don't, I've never seen that. And I no, would have. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see it. It's not a setting. Um, I, I kind of hate using, you know, Kermit vernacular, but it's a hack. It is a way that um, actually one of our schools um, shared with us and we have distributed it everywhere um, to put them in a group and, and that group you point a dummy, you point them to a dummy URL to create a meeting. So they simply cannot, um, you know, it's going to a, a fake URL. Can, can you just share that at some point? Um, <clears throat> I don't have the that article. Would, um, I will send it though. That would I'll be lovely. Thank you. It, David, yeah. Um, can I ask you a question as well? Yeah. Uh, is, is me, there me, any, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Oh, Let me just get my note down. And it is not a violation of your terms of service to have students under the age of 18 having Zoom accounts then? You, these are controlled by the schools or used for authentication. They're not okay. Zoom accounts that are active. It okay, would great. be nice to have that in, in writing somewhere. And I would just mm -hmm. also throw in that it would be really nice if we had the ability to, to turn on and turn off that uh, ability of students to post meetings because there yeah, are- it's not, a, it's not a feature, Joe. It is not a, um, it's not a, uh, a setting. No, no, I know, but it should be <laughs> because it would oh, be Yes, nice. I agree. Um, we may get there, um, but it's not a setting right now. It is, it is um, something that you all will do. You put them in a group, you will um, you'll kind of do the way we're suggesting, but it is not a- Tell, uh, tell the a, folks back at corporate that that's what we're hoping uh, for. Absolutely. I've asked for it at the beginning because it's, it's what's needed. Um, it's, uh, it's in there. I don't have any timeline, but it's in there. Uh, someone had their hand. It was, well, I, I was wondering if there's any plan to have, um, have the Chromebook app be any better than it is. No, we'd love to. 
Google doesn't, um, and they're not putting any money in it. They're ready to sunset what they got. Um, it's a little bit better. It depends if you go in through the web, you get a little better features than going through the app. Um, it does most everything. It doesn't do, um, it doesn't do um, sharing from the student side and annotation from the student side. And kind of depending on the version, um, there's different functionality, higher or lower. Breakout rooms work now, but there are some different. So um, we would love for it to be more robust. Um, I don't anticipate that happening. Google pulled away the promise of sunsetting it and any development on it completely by October um, because of the, you know, the huge use now. Um, but, you know, I, I have no confidence in it getting better right now. And that, that's an internal note um, that we've received and, and kind of us trying to work with them and, you know, how much is, is being invested. Speaking of Chromebooks, one thing that wasn't clear wow. to me, and I, I apologize for jumping in again, um, is how updates work. Because when that Zoom US 5.0 update happened, it wasn't clear what was going to happen with the Chromebooks. And I, and I guess they got updated automatically, but I never really could figure out what exactly happened. Joe, I don't know. I mean, I, most of those were, um, were, there were some auto pushes, most, show, most Zoom updates. Um, you have to go do um, their notification. So I, I'm not sure what exactly happened with the Chromebooks. Well, we were trying to use, we, we were trying to use authentication. We gave our kids accounts, but we used Chromebooks and it, we ran completely aground. Trying to have our students log in with their school accounts, with the basic accounts that we had assigned them on the Chromebook. It just, especially the younger kids, it was just mind numbingly difficult. That's too bad. Um, yeah. So either we did something wrong that, or it just is mine. That, that does work. I mean, you can certainly log in through Chromebooks. It, um, it didn't yeah. seem to persist was the issue for us where they would log in once and then they would step away or log out of the Chromebook and log back in. And then it would uh, have completely erased their sort of the app uh, cache. You have to log in again. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an interesting comment i just got off a call and i was a couple minutes late to this call with a really large district and we we're talking about that that has been a zoom a zoom workflow for a long time it was done for security to not keep people um, logged into zoom um, with that said um you know i can tell you we you know the call today was we want to have a smoother pass through in this particular case, it was with Schoology, keeping him logged in all the way. So um, we're going back to that. I'm thinking about how to do that, how to remain secure um, and, and keep folks logged in. But it is true that you log out of Zoom um, and, and you need to kind of click again when you join a meeting. I just have a clarifying question about the breakout rooms. If we provide all of our students with basic accounts and we authenticate them, we should then be able to use the pre-assigned breakout room feature. Is that correct? correct? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I was a it just sorry, didn't mean it, but I think that too all did not work for us because of the Chromebooks. Because all of our students are on Chromebooks, it did not work. I think those are, um, I think with Chromebook um, breakout rooms, it's the level of the Chromebook ginger. I, um, I hear both on that, you know, whether breakout, I mean, are you saying breakout rooms worked on Chromebooks? No, it worked. So we, we tested it basically on with a variety of devices. We just set up a room with like five different devices that we use. And the Chromebooks, if you pre-assign students with the accounts that we gave them, the basic accounts, it worked on every other device, but it did not work on the Chromebook. But they were be they were still able to join into a breakout room, just not pre-assigned. They just couldn't be pre-assigned. Okay. So that which was, would, would that would be all of our students because for the for the most part, all of our that students may well be a, a, um, yeah. a limitation. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do know that we we got that working on Chromebooks so that they could have the breakout rooms. Um, for a while, that was even a little tricky. Right. Right. 
Okay. Other questions? And I want to, I have not, let's see, there may be some in chat. Um, anyone that put them in chat? I think. Can you talk more about the sort of what you were saying about Google's interaction with the Zoom extension? So they were planning to remove the Zoom extension from their I, ecosystem. You know, I can't speak much to it. This is okay. way third party. Um, what I can tell you is, um, you know, we as a company were under the understanding there wasn't going to be much more support coming on that side and that, you know, it just wasn't going to get better. Um, I think there was a, um, a little bit of a reprieve from that during the, um, during the, the COVID-19, we're still in it, but during this COVID-19 crisis and, and K-12 schools needing more support. So I don't want to speak for Google um, exactly what's going on. I can say that, that um, I don't expect to get it you know, any better than it is right now. Okay, but basically we should be prepared to, if we're using the extension, we should be prepared to use the web client instead. I think it's a little better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, if it's valuable, I don't know if everyone on, on you know, on the call kind of knows the full suite of Zoom products. Um, but I was gonna take a little bit of time um, and just kind of review what it is we have. Um, really kind of simple, simple layout of, of what we do and what we have. So give me a second if um, that sounds like valuable use. Of your time. Can I interrupt you for one second? Can you go back to how to, how the Zoom hack was created if we do give students um, basic accounts. What was it that the school system did? Well, right, and now it's it's dozens. Um, what you do is, if you've been on, I'm sure you have, on the Zoom admin pages, you were able, you were able to put users into groups. And so it's a way to divide up different types of users in your account. And you can do that today. Um, and the groups, again, a common setup in K-12 is at least three groups. A group of your admins, a group of your teachers, and a group of your students. And I'll start with admin, I will get to students. An admin who has a Zoom account is probably not gonna have to worry too much about people jumping into their meetings. And an admin or a trainer or a professional development or someone on the admissions team or who's meeting with a small group of people wants Zoom to you know, have maximum interaction. And so the settings for that group would for instance allow anybody on the call to be able to share their screens. Would allow for anyone on the call to be able to annotate. Might allow anyone to be able to record to their computer. You know, et cetera. So probably the most submitted, most um, permissive settings would belong to admins or professional development staff. Second settings, teachers. Typically, teachers, and this is what Zoom learned um, and, and you know, in the hard way, um, let's make sure teachers' settings are more restrictive, that they have waiting rooms turned on. Maybe admins don't want waiting rooms turned on. So you put that on for that group. You make it so um, students can't share unless the teachers allow for that. You make it so they can't annotate unless the teachers allow for that within a meeting. And so that second group can be teachers. And um, in your settings, um, there's simply a way to go create groups and you drop them in there. And then the third setting gets to the student accounts. 
put all the students, whether you pull them in there through single sign on, however you do it, you get them in a Zoom account, a basic or could even be a pro and, and again, a site deployment. And you create those settings. And basically you're disabling everything. And the allowance to create a meeting is disturbed by you, you, you create, there's like a, there's a setting where um, you point their accounts to a dummy URL, which means they simply cannot start a meeting because it just goes nowhere. And so you're disabling their ability to create a meeting. And again, I'll send um, an article to David and to Joe exactly how to do that. And so the creation of groups. Now, the creation of groups is also a really good thing. I'm gonna show you um, a feature maybe some of you use um, and maybe some of you don't use. I'm gonna uh, do it right on my desktop, share my desktop and pull up the, the Zoom instant messaging tool. Okay. And this tool, this tool allows an organization to set up channels. And those channels are basically groups. Hey, sorry, you got another person in your waiting room, it looks like on your screen. I apologize. Thank you. So for instance, our education team is set up as a group. And there's 73 people on this team from sales folks to engineers. To engineers. I'll um, show you how I can mute Amy, who just came in with her, uh, her video. And by the creation of these tools or these um, channels, you create a communication team across. And so I am able to send an IM to everybody in this group. Imagine this group is teachers or staff, admin staff or IT staff. It can even be a teacher setting up a chat group for, um, for their, uh, their, their class. And if I were to click this invite button, I would go on a live Zoom meeting with every one of these 73 people. But probably where it happens more um, is I'm chatting with an individual and I'm chatting away and I just go, let's jump on a call. And the Zoom I am for chat is a tool that is available to you with an account for free. Um, we think it's a really good um, IM chat system. One of the things you'll see is that it has presence. So I know that Fiona Kaufman is on a Zoom call right now, and I'm not going to disturb her. I know that Michael and Ben are available, but they're on their cell phones. I know that Taylor is in green. I can call him or, you know, he may have an answer, but he's available. I know that John Beekman here is on a Zoom telephone call. So the IM chat is another way that groups can be set up, a little different than the, um, you know, it's a different type, but channels can be set up on the Zoom side. And where that hat, what, what you start seeing is this. This is my Zoom app. And all of the solutions except for the conference rooms in here. So I am able to see my meetings. And I'm able to click on those meetings from here, although I typically go to my calendar. I'm able to use Zoom phone, straight dial, or search for a name and dial by name. I'm able to go to chat as we just looked at and all on the same interface or I'm able to actually go to my profile as well. Okay. And so, you know, the, there's, there's really two parts those groups and then there can be setting up groups for IM and chat. 
that is a tool that's available with accounts that you guys can use today. Okay. The full suite. Let me, um, I don't think I'm sure in this yet. Let me. A new, um, do another share. And just kind of walk through this, um, this suite of tools we're talking about. So we're on, and you guys can see that slide, yes? Thumbs up, yeah. David, you can see my slide. Sorry, my mouse is giving me grief going over to the uh, unmute button. Yes, we can see it. Super, thank you. Okay, so this is um, this is the Zoom kind of suite of products, and lost my mouse too. I'm um, going from left to right. Is Zoom meetings, which we're on. I just showed you Zoom chat and a little bit about Zoom Phone. Zoom Phone is an integrated cloud-based phone system. It sits on an application on your computer, on your cell phone, on your tablet. It can ring in all places. It can be part of a desk phone. It is a unique DID or telephone number. So in a lot of cases, we have schools where faculty don't want to give out their cell phone numbers. Um, school purchases Zoom phone. And Zoom phone rings like a regular phone. It can ring on your cell phone. It can ring on your computer. And Zoom phone um, can be unlimited use. And it can be upgraded from a telephone call to a meeting. So I could have someone on a telephone call and say, okay, let's, let's turn this into a Zoom meeting so we can look at documents. Zoom phone has roving 911. So wherever that teacher is, um, heaven forbid they need to dial 911, um, picks up their location where they are. And it also can have um, a, direct, um, a directed call, not just to obviously emergency services, but to somebody on your campus that there's been a 911 call from the Zoom phone application. You have with Zoom phone tracking of all calls, just like a cell phone bill. Um, you have um, voice um, messaging with a transcript that comes to your email. It also goes to your account as a Zoom phone user. You can record calls. You can have a, um, a answering service or tree where it calls that comes in. Um, you can go to different extensions. You can add, um, add it so um, it's going to one person, call comes in to admissions, goes to person one, they don't answer in 30 seconds, goes to person two, three, whatever it may be, and then to voicemail. It can have scheduling so that an admin can schedule a call for somebody or dial for somebody, those kinds of things. So very robust phone system that is completely integrated and uniquely integrated um, that it was built on the same platform, same design. Um, it's not the purchase of one system and another and the pasting them together, fully integrated with Zoom. Jim, is that something that only a licensed user could use? You could add Zoom phone to basic accounts as well. Everybody that has Zoom phone, a Zoom phone account, would need to have at least a basic account. I mean, you can buy them in, you know, packages of 10 even. So small, small quantities um, can be purchased. And again, you get phone numbers assigned to them. I mean, you can sign extensions as well. Okay. The other product, probably some of you have either used on your own 
or been on is the webinar. And the webinar, the webinar um, allows us to do a Zoom meeting, but there's no one, you don't see or hear attendees. Okay, it's a presentation tool. So you might use the webinar for a graduation ceremony. You might use it for a, um, a presentation about the school by admissions, where you don't wanna see all the attendees' names or all the attendees um, having the ability to chat. There's still Q&A available. I can still send in questions, but those questions aren't public. So we are um, seeing a huge uptick in the use of, um, in the use of um, webinars for things like board meetings and events where privacy needs to be maintained. Um, frankly, it's impossible to disturb a webinar unless you are a, uh, you know, a bad actor, uh, panelists, but I imagine your board and members or teachers that are a part of panelists. So what happens in the webinar is the host creates it, adds panelists, those people that are going to speak and be seen during the meeting, and everyone else is an attendee and in essence anonymous to everybody but the host. Okay, so again, really good tool for um, you know, for managing, uh, managing a meeting. Okay. Zoom rooms. How many of you do, um, do conference rooms? Number, yeah. Um, and the, the conference room solution from Zoom, again, like all of our products is an integrated system. I'm going to jump to, I think I may have it on this, I'll stop my share for a moment. Um, the conference room, there we go, um, set up and I'll give you, I'll show you some pictures here. When you're looking at a Zoom room, what, what it is is a physical room that is set up to um, be a one-touch meeting. And so in a Zoom room, rather than being beholden to your laptop, you typically have one of two solutions. Um, probably the most common um, to date, although changing quickly, is you have built the Zoom room. You put a camera, a microphone, speakers mounted on the wall. You have a couple of monitors. You have a computer typically behind the monitors, like a Mac mini that houses the Zoom room software. And you have, as you see in this, this picture, um, you have a controller. And the Zoom room controller is merely in this case just a uh, just an iPad with the Zoom software on it, and it allows you to start a meeting, to share documents, to change cameras, and so this kind of thing is amazing in a classroom. Um, certainly, conference rooms, um, your headmaster's office or or boardroom, and I walk in, touch it, and I've started a meeting. Okay. The let's see, let's move this thing forward. Sorry, I stop that share. So I'm getting stuck on this. The um, Zoom rooms allow 
couple of things. One of them is wireless sharing. So if I have a Zoom room set up, I can share my computer within that room without ever having to log into a meeting by simply being in that room. Flip open my laptop and through a local share, I can share what's on my computer. Really nice when you think about bandwidth. I think one of the questions that came in before this meeting was the, you know, was concerned about bandwidth. If everyone's logged into a Zoom meeting, even though it's low bandwidth, um, it's still a use of bandwidth. And so if you're, you know, you're on a, um, a you know, Mac device and uh, just picking up that radio signal from that iPad, you can do wireless sharing locally. So nice feature. Again, the integration is, is really simple with a Zoom room. You can actually go from, let's say I'm on a meeting on my phone, I come into a Zoom room, I can jump right into the Zoom room from my phone. But you can also from a Zoom room, start a meeting and invite anyone. So again, imagine head of school is in a Zoom room, clicks it. I can invite anybody on my contact list into a room, into his meeting. I can use it as a telephone and I can have multiple participants in it from right from the Zoom room. It can be set up with a scheduling display. And one of the things that I think you guys um, like is one of the features of a Zoom room license is digital signage. So if I have a Zoom room license, I can use the tool within that license to set up signage around my school, around my campus. And those can be, um, you know, it can be video, it can be PowerPoints rotating, it can be fixed, you know, fixed images. And I can even, if you, if you picture this, have five or six monitors set up. Um, they can use a little, um, uh, you can wire it or, or you need to have a, one of the little um, uh, Google, um, I forget what they're called, but the little, little Google computer units, plug those things in. Um, and I can go live on digital signage it's not two way like a Zoom room, but I could actually have these multiple places in the school and do live sessions, broadcast over these displays. Um, so with one Zoom room license, you can have multiple um, digital signage set up across a campus. Um, and another really good way to use that Zoom room license. Jim, I'm gonna jump in here with a question. Um, a lot of us are, are participate in this um, independent tech listserv and we talk a lot about we're making preparations for a hybrid teaching environment in the fall where we've got some kids at home and some kids in the classroom and we're looking at this and we're not thinking about digital signage we're thinking about would this be something that would be worth spending the extra money on if it would improve that environment and i have to say so far i'm, I'm not really seeing that um, except, I mean, I, I like the fact that it has convenience for turning it on without having to schedule a meeting, but hey, I'm willing to schedule a meeting if it saves me uh, a couple thousand bucks for setup per room. Um, I'm going to play a quick video. So give me a second to set this up. And this is from a partner. Um, the partner that set this up is a company. I haven't gotten to this part of the uh, Presentation. We are yet. on campus to test the new but Zoom the, room um, technology. This... Join us, but first, masks. Okay. okay. Okay, now we're ready. Classrooms get one of these sleek D10 boards. It's basically a Zoom room in a box. You can either sign into the board with Here's Zoom second. or just enter a meeting ID and poof, you're in a Zoom room. Okay. 
students in the classroom can see, hear, and interact with all the students okay, who are now we're ready. Home. Classrooms get one of these, and if you're learning from a distance, you can feel like you're basically a Zoom room in a box. Students you can either sign into the, the presentation, presentation ID, at the same and time, poof, and choose you're in a Zoom where room. they need their attention to be, depending on whether or not the teacher is speaking or if there's a class discussion mid-lecture. The Zoom board itself also has a whiteboard feature in case you wanted to use it, just like the whiteboard in your classroom. And let me start that again. So again, what what I'm showing you is a company that has built Zoom rooms as a device, as a all-in-one unit. Okay, and so these units. These units have all of those components that I just shared. Here we go. We are on camera. you'll get a feel of how this would work in a classroom. We are on campus to test the new Zoom Room technology. Join us, but first, masks. Okay, now we're ready. Classrooms get one of these sleek D10 boards. It's basically a Zoom Room in a box. You can either sign into the board with Zoom or just enter a meeting ID and poof, you're in a Zoom Room. Teachers and students in the classroom can see, hear, and interact with all the students who are learning from home. And if you're learning from a distance, you can feel like you're a part of the class. Students at home can view the presentation and the classroom at the same time and choose where they need their attention to be, depending on whether or not the teacher is speaking or if there's a class discussion mid-lecture. The Zoom board itself also has a whiteboard feature in case you wanted to use it just like the whiteboard in your classroom and allow all students to see regardless of where they're learning from. This even enables you to show videos that students at home and at school can view and hear simultaneously. D10 boards will enable you to have one lesson plan that all students can participate in regardless of where they are. It should save you a lot of time in getting a Zoom class started before you even have your computer connected if you're a traveling teacher. If you're feeling nervous about the technology, don't worry, we'll have plenty of time before school starts for you to play around with it and get used to okay. students in your room real or virtual so that is that is an example or kind of a showing of the, the classroom setting um joe you may feel they're you know they're minimal value what i would say about zoom rooms is the technology allows for better audio and video the technology allows especially in a larger room for the mixing of sound it allows for multiple screens so a teacher can see both content as well as the students that are at a distance if they're doing hybrid courses. Um, it allows for a full-scale whiteboard. Um, that particular technology was from a company called D10, D-T-E-N. Um, you can find them on the Zoom website. They're one of, they're a um, hardware partner. And what I like about that um, and a couple others is literally those are mobile. So you don't have to outfit every single room with the hardware. You can, um, but there's no question it's a substantial expense. Should every room be a Zoom room? Um, yeah, if you were, um, if you had part of your capital expense in building out the technology in your rooms, known of Zoom technology would have been a pretty easy thing to make that room Zoom compatible. But the reality is, um, with schools around the country, is that's a retrofit and it's an expense. So we do have schools, um, you know, private schools building out, you know, 70 classrooms. 
um, because they're just gonna outfit their rooms so that they're compatible with Zoom. But there is a difference than just kind of sticking a, you know, bigger speakers and mics on a, on a, um, on a laptop than the Zoom room. Other questions? I'm going to go back to the topic of uh, bandwidth. Can you can you refer us to some kind of documentation about how we can, if we're using Zoom, which our school will be um, in the fall for, you know, how we need to calculate our school's bandwidth needs for some, you know, multiple Zoom, simultaneous Zoom meetings? Yeah, let's see if this. Yeah, um, go to, as a general rule, go to support.zoom.us if you haven't been on that page. Um, it's a pretty good search. And it will give you some ideas on this particular one. I won't say it's in here, but I will, um, I'll send, um, I'll send you and David um, that information as well. The average, you know, up and down. But in, but do, you know, you, you can get a lot of those questions answered um, there. I'm um, the bandwidth. I thought it was in there. I'm not finding it right now, but I will send that to you. Jim, another question that uh, was posted um, before the session, it's asking, are there any side effects on converting existing Zoom accounts to EDU or to pro accounts? No. And going back and forth. Meeting invites are saved. If you have recordings, those are saved. Seamless upgrade. And I know there were questions about pricing. Um, you know, the, the pricing, there are education, there is um, education specific pricing. Um, it begins at um, less than half of standard pricing. It is, um, or about depending on what program you're at, but um, you know, less than or a half of standard monthly pricing at ninety dollars per year per license for twenty licenses. That's the minimum education package. That gets you um, a enterprise account. Enterprise account, I'm going to go ahead and put this in the chat as well. Enterprise account allows um, these features. Again, I'll put these in chat. Um, and those are just, that just is kind of what comes with that. Um, schools will typically license all staff as pro accounts um, and Kind of the next break gets at about 150 counts. Um, and again, I don't, you know, it, it depends what you need. If you need webinars, Zoom rooms, we can work with you on, on a pricing package. One of the uh, other questions I'm seeing, and I think you kind of addressed this uh, earlier, it says um, they're wondering about this E to E encryption versus phones. There is no end-to-end -end encryption with phones. There can't be. Because with any phone, I mean, and that's any phone anywhere. With any phones you're connecting, it's not all on the Zoom platform. So you are connecting them through a pop to another provider. Every single phone call you ever make. So end-to-end um, -end encryption, you're going Zoom to Zoom. Um, that can be made available can never happen with phones. You know, unless you're the government and you have the same pipeline going from one, you know, one place to the next. And I believe you've answered all the questions that were posted prior to this. So thank you very much. I have I just, one question. Um, can you talk a little bit about the app marketplace? So I'm starting now over the summer to see a little bit of a change in terms of 
faculty and staff. So they're requesting cal you know, Calendly and different types of apps. Do you have any best practices? Is there any issue with kind of um, letting them use those um, third party apps? I, I would say no. Um, you know, the things like um, the plugin from Outlook and Gmail, for example, um, we use internally. Um, what I can say about all of those is that they are vetted and tested for security and functionality before they're allowed to be put into the marketplace. That is not a free for all post something, you know, and, and let the consumer beware. Okay. So Great. they are, they are um, reviewed very closely by the Zoom team before they're put on the ad marketplace. Jim, I have a technical question. Uh, and I see one of my colleagues had a very similar one. It's about uh, bulk upload uh, of the users to, to Zoom. I did it with my faculty and staff, but that required uh, interaction. Uh, they got the emails and they had to answer. Is there a way to avoid that and bulk upload and uh, authenticate uh, kids without forcing them to log in? Yeah, well, I don't know about the without forcing them to log in. Well, without, just authenticate so yeah, they are approved. Absolutely, you can do single sign-on through, you know, through, um, you know, through Active Directory or something like that, where you can, you put them in there. So what did you do as a CSV file? And yeah, I just did a CSV file with my faculty and stuff. That required a send back and forth. Right, they would still have to accept. So yeah, you can. Um, I think there is a way to do that. Or I would go to, again, that support.zoom.us. The answer is yes, there's single sign-on. Um, we have authenticated, you know, tens of thousands through, uh, you know, through Active Directory. It's like they're, they're set up somewhere else and you do the pass through authentication. Okay. We, we ran into this um, as well, and we're actually working through it right now. You have to leverage the Zoom API for whatever reason. Um, so my database admin's working on it right now, um, just using Postman and um, bringing in the accounts that way. Because we have the same issue. We don't have email to students in the younger grades, but we, they do have Google accounts. Uh -huh. And so, like you said, Artur, is that you have the email goes out and then they have to log into their email to accept it. And it becomes this two way communication. And so if you leverage the API, you can um, post, you can create those accounts directly and bypass that whole two way communication. Um, I don't have the particulars. I just sent him the um, support doc on it and he's working on it now. If you email me offline. Um, okay. I can I'll hook you up with him and um, I'll just put my email in the chat and um, you two can, yeah, work it out together. Thanks. Appreciate yep. it. James, thank you. And I knew I was in trouble when you know, Archer started by saying <laughs> he had a technical question. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. If, does anyone else have any uh, last questions? I had a quick question about pricing and what we should buy essentially um, because we've been told a number of different things. We're a very small school. We're looking at 22 staff members total. So we were told by one rep by email that we should just get pro accounts. We were told by someone else that we needed education. And so really just a better breakdown of what type of solution would better match that size. So, um you're told by a rep of pro accounts that was dialing in, calling and getting to a non-education rep. I would say flat out, um, I would not get anything other than the EDU accounts. One, they're half price. Um, two, they, I sent you the functionality of an enterprise account. So with single pro accounts, you do not get that. Okay. That, that was my understanding yeah, or my thought flat process. Out. But flat out, I mean, you know, people go, well, we only need 10. Great. 10 pro accounts cost you the same as, or, you know, 13 pro accounts cost the same as 20 education accounts. Um, okay. Or, you know, 10 business accounts are the same as 20 um, education accounts. I would absolutely do an education. One of the other reasons is, um, I'm not trying to, you know, to sell vision, 
but we are working more and more in particular on what is the needs of K-12. So having an EDU account, having a K-12 EDU account, um, you're kind of part of the push to continue to develop features and security unique. So I would, I would um, absolutely at a minimum do that EDU 20. Um, I put my email into the chat. Um, the only thing I'd ask is um, if you guys reach out, please put your school name, uh, maybe even reference to this uh, meeting, and I'll see it. You know, if it's just um, need help, um, sometimes I miss them. So put your school name, um, school address, things like that are great. Um, and, um, you know, a couple of my teammates I don't typically cover. Um, I think most of you are Maryland, Virginia kind of areas. I don't typically um, cover that, but I've worked with um, some of my colleagues and said, look, I have an opportunity to speak with a bunch of uh, IT directors um, from privates um, back east. And, you know, I will help kind of take their accounts and, you know, there may be some stuff coming in and um, I want to make sure we service them. So um, I, I you know, mentioned that to uh, only had his name as AO earlier, but um, I will be happy to to respond and get back to you as quick as I can. Okay. Jim, Joe, guys, um, oh, there's more another question. I, yeah, this is Andy. Uh, I'm on the phone, so you won't be able to see my name. I did just not so much a question, just well, a kind of a request. You know, this, this the issue of uh, Chromebook support is going to be significant for my school. Um, is there a way for us to be able to kind of see how that develops? Over time, like, is there is there some place that we can kind of keep track of what Zoom is thinking relative to Chromebooks? Um, mm -hmm. I know Google is doing their thing relative to Meet and trying to catch up with Zoom, and it's a bit of a foot race right now. Um, I'll, I'll leave I'll leave the last comment if it's a, if it's a race right now or a foot race. Um, Andy, I don't know if you were here when I spoke about this earlier. Um, I'm not anticipating many improvements from where we're at now. Okay. So, okay. Okay. That is, that tells me what I need to know. Okay. All right. All right, Jim, thank you. Joe, again, thank you for arranging this for our community. Uh, we really appreciate okay. your time. Pleasure. Um, I really thank you all for obviously a lot of time um, for asking questions and uh, you guys have a great weekend and array uh, a long weekend next weekend. Thank you, Jim. That was hugely helpful. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, David. See you guys soon. Thanks, David. Bye-bye.